Now broadcasting from beautiful downtown Tallahassee, it's Classic Movie Reviews with Snark. Welcome to today's show. My name is John, and I'm feeling like a white rabbit because I'm very late. As always, you can subscribe to the show on iTunes or follow the links to social media in the podcast show notes. You can also go to snarkymoviereviews.com to read notes, bios, and other random movie thoughts. Today's movie is the first of two that pay tribute to the 101st Airborne Division, the Screaming Eagles, and their action at the Battle of the Bulge, December 16th through 25th, 1944, 71 years ago this month. The division was surrounded near a small Belgian town, Bastogne. This movie and next week's tell highly fictionalized but entertaining versions of the brave men that fought to stop the Nazis' winter attack. Today's movie is Battleground 1949, and it features an ensemble cast. So we'll jump right in. Van Johnson played the main role of infantryman PFC Holly. As a youth in Rhode Island, Johnson's parents were absent. He drifted towards the arts as an escape. After high school, he left for New York. In New York, he did all right with some chorus line work and ended up being in a Broadway review by 1936. He was an understudy three times and finally got a lead. During this time, he became friends with Desi Arnaz, and his first film was a Lucy Desi comedy, Too Many Girls, 1940. Johnson didn't do that well in the film. Back on Broadway, he was spotted by a Warner Brothers agent and signed for a short contract. He co-starred in Murder in the Big House, 1942. They dropped him based on his poor acting. Lucille Ball introduced Johnson to the head of casting at MGM, and he had a successful screen test. World War II pulled most of the top male stars away from Hollywood. This worked out for Johnson as he began to get a lot of roles, such as Somewhere I'll Find You, 1942, The War Against Mrs. Hadley, 1942, and The Human Comedy, 1943. During the filming of A Guy Named Joe, 1943, Johnson was severely injured in a car wreck. The injuries made Johnson ineligible for military service, ensuring he would be in Hollywood for the duration of the war. This film also made Johnson a star, and he was a heartthrob. He continued to make films of various genres, such as Two Girls and a Sailor, 1944, Easy to Wed, 1946, Weekend at the Waldorf, 1945, and 30 Seconds Over Tokyo, 1944. When the big stars came back from the war, Johnson had to take a step down. However, it was during this time that Johnson made some of his finest films. These movies include Command Decision 1948 with Clark Gable, State of the Union 1948, Battleground 1949, a great war movie that set the mold for what was to follow, Brigadoon 1954, and The Cane Mutiny 1954, which very well may be one of the greatest movies of all time. In the 1950s, Johnson's career began to wane. He still made movies such as The Last Time I Saw Paris, 1954, with Elizabeth Taylor, The End of the Affair, 1955, with Deborah Carr, Miracle in the Rain, 1956, The Bottom of the Bottle, 1956, with Joseph Cotton, 23 Paces to Baker Street, 1956, co-starring Vera Miles, Kelly and Me, 1957, with a dog, and Web of Evidence, 1959, but the end was in sight. He used his singing skills to make a good living as a lounge act. Johnson died at the age of 92 in 2008. Ricardo Montalban played the role of Private Rodriguez. Montalban was born in Mexico in 1920. After moving to Los Angeles, he was cast in a play with Tallulah Bankhead in 1940. A family illness necessitated his return to Mexico. During that time, he worked towards stardom in Mexico. MGM brought him back to L.A. to be the Latin lover type in films such as Fiesta 1947 and Neptune's Daughter 1949, both with Esther Williams. He was actually in a film titled Latin Lover 1953. Montalban had a good run through the 40s and the 50s with films like Border Incident 1949, Mystery Street 1950, classic war film Battleground 1949, the boxing drama Right Cross 1950, Across the Wide Missouri, 1951, with Clark Gable, The Queen of Babylon, 1954, and acting as a Japanese kabuki, Sayonara, 1957. He worked extensively on stage and in television, but there are a couple that stand out above the rest. The first is a 1967 Star Trek, where he played superhuman villain Khan Noonan Singh. He reprised this role in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, 1982, 
which is probably one of the greatest character returns of all time. The other important television role was as Mr. Rourke on Fantasy Island 1977-84. He helped the apes overcome as kindly circus owner Armando in Escape from the Planet of the Apes 1971 and Conquest of the Planet of the Apes 1972. Montalban was very successful on nighttime soap operas such as Dynasty. He spoofed his own self in The Naked Gun from The Files of the Police Squad 1988. He played the grandfather in Spy Kids 2 Island of Lost Dreams 2002 and Spy Kids 3D Game Over 2003. Montalban died at home at the age of 88 in 2009. Don Taylor had a role as Soldier Standifield. Taylor started working in Hollywood before he was drafted into World War II. Following the war, he was in a lot of films, including Song of the Thin Man, 1947, The Naked City, 1948, Battleground, 1949, Ambush, 1950, Father of the Bride, 1950, Target Unknown, 1951, Father's Little Dividend, 1951, Flying Leathernecks, 1951 with John Wayne, Submarine Commander, 1951, Japanese War Bride, 1952, Destination Gobi, 1953, The Girls of Pleasure Island, 1953, Stalag 17, 1953, where he played Rich Lieutenant James Dunbar against William Holden Sefton, and The Men of Sherwood Forest, 1954, where he played Robin Hood. James Whitmore played the role of Tough Sergeant Kenny. Whitmore received a B.A. from Yale before he joined the Marines in World War II. Following his discharge, he studied acting with the G.I. Bill. He worked on the stage in command decision, but lost the film role to Van Johnson. Whitmore bounced back with The Undercover Man, 1949, starring Glenn Ford, and Battleground, 1949. He played a good family man in The Next Voice You Hear, 1950. Played an inept crook in The Asphalt Jungle, 1950. A cop ant fighter in Them, 1954. A tough social worker in Crime in the Streets, 1956. A Man Passing for Black in Black Like Me, 1964, and as Chief Ape in Planet of the Apes, 1968. He returned in a small role as the Birdman in The Shawshank Redemption, 1994. Whitmore died in 2009. Leon Ames played the role of the chaplain. Ames worked in a theater company long before he made it to Broadway by 1933. His first movie was Murders in the Rue Morgue, 1932. A prolific actor, he had over 150 acting credits, ranging from playing the father in Meet Me in St. Louis, 1944, with Judy Garland, as the DA in the film noir classic The Postman Always Rings Twice, 1946, and as Kathleen Turner's grandfather in Peggy Sue Got Married, 1986. On television, he is best known as the neighbor of Mr. Ed, 1963 to 65. Ames died at 91 in 1993. Herbert Anderson played Private Hanson. Anderson is best known for working as the dad of Dennis the Menace, 1959 to 63. Denise Darcel played the role of Belgian girl Denise. Very clever. Darcel was born in France in 1925. She won a beauty contest and parlayed it into a successful nightclub act. After she married a GI, she moved to America. Shortly, she divorced and began working in movies. Her first film was To the Victor, 1948. She was the only woman in Battleground 1949 and was very sexy in Tarzan and the Slave Girl 1950. In the early 1950s, she played sexy roles in Young Men with Ideas 1952 with Glenn Ford, Westward the Women 1951 with Robert Taylor, Flame of Calcutta 1953 with Patrick Knowles, Vera Cruz 1954 with Burt Lancaster, and finally Seven Women from Hell 1961. It is said that her roles were cut because she refused advances from the head of Columbia and Howard Hughes. She worked on stage and later as a car dealer in Las Vegas. Richard Jekyll played a soldier that was suffering from battle fatigue named Bettis. Jekyll was covered in episode 37, The Violent Men, 1955. James Arness played Private Gabby. I'm only going to mention three things about Arness. First, he played the marshal in Gunsmoke, 1955 to 1975 on television. Second, he was the monster in The Thing from Another World, 1951. Finally, his brother is Peter Graves. Scotty Beckett had a small but important role as soldier William J. Hooper. Beckett was a very popular child star in the 1930s through the early 50s. He was in 15 Our Gang features. By the late 1940s, he was hitting the late-night scene. 
His drinking and divorces caused him to lose a lot of roles in the 1950s. He was later charged in an attempted robbery of a hotel. He took his family to Mexico and began kiting checks. When the Federales came for him, there was a gun battle. He served four months in a Mexican jail, which I assume was hard time. He got three years probation in the U.S. When the Little Rascals made a comeback, he was able to ride on the wave. However, it didn't last long. In 1957, he was arrested bringing drugs from Mexico to the U.S. His second wife divorced him and took the kid. Beckett tried to kill himself with pills. By 1959, he began getting into trouble again. With drunk driving and assault charges, his third wife left in 1963 after Beckett tried again to kill himself. In 1967, he died of a barbiturate overdose. Story Battleground 1949 is one of the first films that showed infantry fighting the Germans in World War II, and many of the actors were actual veterans. The movie begins with two fresh recruits arriving at their unit who are joining a veteran unit that is in a rear area training camp. The veterans are resting following Operation Market Guard, which we will talk about in A Bridge Too Far 1977, which we will review in the future. They also feel that the war is winding down and they will not be returning to the front. You Band of Brothers fans may remember that the 101st was told they would be in combat for less than two weeks before they landed the night before D-Day. However, it was 444 days before they left Europe and combat. Anyway, the new recruits, Private Jim Layton, Marshall Thompson, and William J. Hooper, Scotty Beckett, are sent to separate companies. Private Hooper makes a couple of statements that ring true for all armies at all times. You know, they got a man in the army, a two-star general that all he does is fly around in a private plane looking for ugly places, flat, sandy places, no trees, no water. Then he checks up on the climate. If it's too hot in summer for human life and too cold in winter, and if it has more rain and fog and wind and snow than any other spot he can find, then he plants the American flag and proclaims it a U.S. Army camp. Why'd they have to put us in different companies? I mean, if we asked them, they might do something. There's another major general. His job is to find out who your buddy is and then to split you up. When Private Layton gets to his platoon tent, the close-knit, combat-hardened veterans are not very interested in him and his comfort at all, as they all prepare to start a three-day pass in Paris the following morning. We meet all the soldiers in the tent. The old man, Kippy Kipton, Doug Foley. Arthritis man, Pop, George Murphy. Country boy Abner Spudler, Jerome Cortland. Token minority Rodriguez, Ricardo Montalban. Coward Bettis, Richard Jackal, who is closest to the role of the scrounger. The playboy Standafield, Don Taylor. The jock Wallowitz, Bruce Cowling. And the cynic Jarvis, John Hodak. Just before lights out, the man Layton has come to replace, PFC Holly, Van Johnson, returns from the hospital as good as new. As a result, Private Layton doesn't have a cot to sleep on the first night. Pops has been told he is going home because his wife is sick. At 4 a.m., Staff Sergeant Kenny, James Whitmore, wakes the squad and tells them the Germans have broken through. Holly belly aches about the generals volunteering the division, but not really going along. They load up in deuce and a half trucks, meet the replacement 2nd Lieutenant Tice, Brett King, who is by the book. The trucks head east until they reach Bastogne, Belgium. Abner says that they may get some rest here in a bit of irony. They are ordered to billet in the houses, and a few of the men are lucky to be placed in the house of the beautiful Denise, Denise Darcel. who was pretty much the only woman in the movie. PFC Holly is putting the hard press on her, but it's costing him a small fortune in chocolate bars and cigarettes. They get a rumor that they will be staying in the town, so he feels good about his investment. Private Jarvis goes out for guard duty in the fog, and before long he encounters American troops falling back before a huge German onslaught. In the morning, Holly is out stealing eggs from the poor people that were trapped by the battle when they get the word to move. They have some good physical comedy with him trying to get the eggs cooked, but all in all, it was a douchebag move to steal the eggs. The squad moves east of the town. As they are moving along a road, they come under fire. As Private Layton hits the ground, he sees Christ on the cross above him. 
This bit was used again in The Big Red One, 1980, which is also about a squad in World War II as well, but it is a vastly different movie. The squad clears a small area of woods and begins to dig in. Since Layton is an odd man, he is paired with Wallowitz and Hansen. The two go to the CP to check in and make Layton dig the entire foxhole. As soon as they finish, the squad has to move to another location and do the same thing again. That night, PFC Holly, Private Layton, and Private Kipton are placed on guard duty on the road. In the middle of the night, a patrol of Americans come by. The squad knows the password and the countersign. They ask the privates if a bridge is down the road. Holly is a little concerned that the lieutenant is wearing his shiny bars on patrol. However, he chalks it up to the lieutenant being a 90-day wonder. After the patrol leaves, one of them speaks German, revealing that they are indeed spies. In the morning, the ground is covered with snow. Rodriguez goes crazy yelling and running around because he has never seen snow before. Look, Bob! It's snowing! It's snowing! Ah! I never saw snow close before. It's beautiful! You didn't by any chance hear that it's kind of cold and a little on the wet side, did you? Rodriguez warns Abner about sleeping with his boots off. The guards come in and they find out that the bridge has been blown and they know that they let the Nazis go by. However, they don't share this information with anyone. Private Layton finds K Company and finds out that Hooper has been killed and no one in the squad knew his name. At the mail call, Pops looks for his discharge, but it doesn't come. Wallowitz sends out a three-man patrol consisting of PFC Holly, Private Rodriguez, and Private Jarvis. The squad comes under artillery fire and Bettis runs away. A jeep comes up the road and a major in the jeep knows the password. They have some intense times while they figure out that everyone is American based on pop cultural knowledge. Password. Texas. Keep in cover. They may be German. Any line on these woods, Major? I didn't hear the counter sign. Oh, Liga. Texas Liga. Will this road take us to Dead Bat Headquarters? Straight ahead. Get going. Just a minute. What is the Texas Liga, Major? How's that? I said, what's the Texas Liga? It's some kind of baseball term. What kind? A safe hit just over the head of the infield. Nobody asked you how the Dodgers make out this year. Hey, who's your commanding officer, soldier? Whoever he is, he knows how the Dodgers made out. They run into some soldiers in the woods, and Holly recognizes them as the Germans from the road. He pretends everything is okay, and the patrol gets some distance away before a firefight breaks out. The Americans throw a grenade and kill a lot of the Germans, but they still have to do some hand-to-hand fighting. Then Rodriguez sees German tanks. Before he can react, he is shot down by the tank's machine gun. Since they can't carry him, they hide him under a jeep and cover him with snow. The other two run back to report as the Germans advance. Since they don't have any anti-armor weapons, Sergeant Kenny recommends to the lieutenant that they call in artillery fire on the Germans, but it is near where Rodriguez is hiding. They also find out that Sergeant Wallowitz was hit and is heading back. This makes Holly the new squad sergeant. Holly, Layton, Pops, and Jarvis head out to get Rodriguez. When the patrol gets to Rodriguez, he is already dead from blood loss and cold. They mark the dead area and head back with extreme sadness. The men finally get a Stars and Stripes newspaper and find out about the bulge and where they're located. They also find out that the weather is keeping all American planes grounded. Sergeant Kenny and the lieutenant let the men know that they are not taking frostbite or fever cases and they are out of medicine at the aid station. They also let them know that the field hospital has been overrun and the wounded Americans put up a good fight. Layton and Holly are on guard duty at the road again. Pops comes out to say goodbye as he is being sent back. Kip finds his teeth and tells the others that they are surrounded by Germans and that Pops can't leave. The group comes under artillery fire again. Layton is showing signs of becoming a hardened veteran. They send the squad forward to dig in by a railroad. The lieutenant is now belly aching like Holly did earlier. Holly tells the men to check their bolts to see if they are frozen. Garby, James Arness, ignores the order. The man on guard duty silhouettes himself against the bridge opening and is shot by the Germans. Hansen crawls forward and begins firing. Kip moves up and gives support until Hansen is hit. Then Pops, now a civilian, comes forward to help. Holly freaks out and runs away, but Layton follows him. Holly. Come on. When he sees he is not alone, he moves to flank the Germans. 
Sergeant Kenny sees what is happening and moves the rest of the squad into ambush position. Abner is shot trying to get his boots on, and Garby is shot while his bolt won't open. The ambush of the Germans is successful, and those that are not killed are captured. They take the prisoners and the wounded back to the rear and begin to see the problem they have. There is little food, ammo, or medicine. Cooks, anti-aircraft, and mechanics are moved into the infantry. Men rummage through piles of boots and equipment outside the aid station. At the aid station, Pop tries to get medicine for Hanson, but there is none to be had. They run into Bettis and he is working in a kitchen. He gives him some hot chow. Holly heads to find Denise, but when he gets there, Leighton is already there drinking and having a fine time. Denise, bonjour! Pull up a chair, Holly. Today you are a man. He explained to the men that Bastogne is in the middle of a major road intersection that leads to the port of Antwerp. If the port falls, dozens of Allied divisions would be cut off. A group of Germans with a white flag comes forward and asks to be taken to the commanding general. The commander is Major General McCullough. They take the officers to the general, and the enlisted men stay with the squad. The squad bribes the enlisted Germans with cigarettes to tell what's in the message. The officers come back and the squad finds out that when the German officers demanded the American surrender, McAuliffe simply replied, nuts. The Major Six General McAuliffe must have misunderstood. He had appealed to the well-known American humanity to save the people of Bastogne from further suffering. We have given you two hours to consider before raining destruction upon you. We do not understand General McCauley's answer. I'd be glad to repeat it. The answer is nuts. Nisse. Is that a negative or a positive sin? Is that a negative or an affirmative reply? Nuts is strictly negative. Negative. The fighting in the bad weather continues until Christmas. The Americans are under around-the-clock shelling. At the Christmas services, Chaplain Leon Ames holds a service in the field using a jeep as an altar. Any of you men Lutherans? Here, sir. Here, sir. I am, sir. My wife is, sir. (laughs) So am I. But these services aren't just for Lutherans anymore than they're just for men from Ohio. I merely happen to be in your area. In other areas are other chaplains of various denominations and religions. All of us Holy Joes are switch hitters. Earlier this month in Holland, I held Hanukkah services for some of the men of the Jewish faith. How did I do, Levenstein? Not bad for a beginner, sir. Was this trip necessary? Well, let's look at the facts. Nobody wanted this war but the Nazis. A great many people tried to deal with them and a lot of them are dead. Millions have died for no other reason except that the Nazis wanted them dead. So, in the final showdown, there was nothing left to do except fight. There's a great lesson in this. And those of us who've learned it the hard way aren't going to forget it. We must never again let any force dedicated to a super race or a super idea or super anything become strong enough to impose itself upon a free world. We must be smart enough and tough enough in the beginning to put out the fire before it starts spreading. He does a great job and then is forced to shorten his sermon as the artillery begins again. When it looks like the end is near, the sky is clear and Allied fighters begin to rain death on the Germans. Supplies are dropped by cargo planes. The chaplain goes around and shows disgust as he finds dinner rations. Finally, he finds the ammo and calls the men to arm themselves. The sheer joy of the killing montage is a little shocking. After the Germans are defeated, what's left of the squad sits by the road waiting for Sergeant Kinney. He forms him up facing the fighting and then gives him the about face. The battered bastards of Bastogne limp down the road as fresh troops are coming in. Kenny calls them to attention and they march away with pride knowing they have done their part. 
I have read a few reviews about this movie and it receives a little criticism for jumping from a comedy to a love story to a war movie. But I have to disagree because military life has been described as 99% boredom and 1% sheer terror. The interactions of the men and the growth of the new man into a soldier seems logical and realistic. World famous short summary. Guys work out pecking order set against the backdrop of the Battle of the Bulge. Okay folks, it's time to sign up for my email list as the free EPUB for subscribers will be released in early January. It's around 200 pages, has 50 reviews that are cleaned and cross-referenced, and original artwork. If you want a copy, it's completely free to list members. Okay, so if you enjoyed this week's show, please tell your friends, and if you really want to help, drop over to iTunes and give me a review. If you want to comment, recommend a movie, or just say hi, follow the links in the show notes to my site. I have SpeakPipe, so you can leave audio feedback as well. Beware the Moors.